Monday Colloquium. It's a pleasure for me to introduce today uh, Alexis Santos Lozada. Alexis is an assistant professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. He's also an affiliate of the Population Research Institute and has a secondary appointment in the Department of, of Sociology, also at Penn State. Alexis received his PhD in demography from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, we met during one of my visits there in 2015. Uh, his work mainly focuses on understanding social disparities in stress, health, and mortality. He's arguably one of the most prominent and rising demographers of, the, of Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican population. Um, his work focused specifically on the effect of climate disasters on mortality and transmission of disease. He's the PI of the Puerto Rican Diaspora Study, an online, online survey of Puerto Ricans living in the US where they provide information about the strategies they employ by their families to deal with post-hurricane disaster conditions. In addition, he's also relying on historical vital statistics data to, <coughs> to better measure the effect of Hurricane Maria on mortality in Puerto Rico. Uh, despite being a recent PhD, Alex's work has appeared in the most prestigious journals in the field, like the Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health, Health Affairs and Social Science and Medicine, just to name a few. His estimate of excess mortality due to Hurricane Maria on mortality in Puerto Rico was published in JAMA and received considerably, considerable media attention, including in the New York Times. So please help me welcome Alexis Santos Rosario. So what's the mass policy? Do I keep it? Do I take it off? Can I take it off? Okay. It's up to you. Take it off because I want to project my voice. Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. <clears throat> and it's quite an honor to be here actually. Yesterday I bought a UPenn t shirt um, <laughs> and I'll take it with me back home. And so this presentation is, is going to be a little bit of fun. I'm having a lot of fun with my research and I hope I can convey that to you guys uh, during my presentation. And why I'm focusing on all these things is because I, I reach a point in which I am very interested not only in seeing whether patterns that we observe at the population level uh, hold with nowhere data, but also whether that pattern was true for sub sectors of the population when they were discovered. And then you'll see why uh, in a second. And I think this morning we ha I had many conversations on this matter. Uh, and I think there's a lot of persons looking at this from different angles. And so, but I want to talk to you about this picture. This is a picture I took when Emilio visited uh, uh, the University of Texas in San Antonio. And if you can see here, this is Jason Choi, who is an alumni from uh, uh, UPenn. He transferred here, right? Uh, and I remember, you know, like we come from an environment where we didn't have a lot of money in my program. And so we only had one speaker per first semester, and that semester it was a million. And I just want to say, I want to say thank you to you for always having words of encouragement to me, uh, particularly in this picture with René Centeno, who also is a, a UPenn uh, a postdoc, right, René? That's right, René. Uh, I had just defended my dissertation, having uh, gone through a period of uh, my, uh, myocarditis that also put me in a hospital for two weeks. And I only, you know, a PAA San Diego for me was a fantastic moment in which I had so many words of encouragement in a moment in which I was actually thinking of leaving academia and you were there and I, I don't have a hundred percent of the recollections of what was said but things were said that kept me in academia. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but I, have, I don't have hair anymore. <laughs> so, okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a population health scientist and I'm interested in self-reported health, what it is and what it's not, you know, what goes into us talking about our health because We've been asking these questions for 40 years. We truly don't know what people are considering when we're, they're saying my health is good, my health is bad. Is it their physiology? Is it their social relations? Is it something else? Is it the day I'm asking the question? Will you answer this the same way on a Friday night after you had a whole week of work? Or on a Sunday where you're relaxing, you know, having a drink, listening to some music in the radio in your house? Um, whether those patterns and how we respond to health um, questions uh, match or don't match the physiology in our bodies. 
And um, what are the implications of this for subsequent mortality? So I care a lot about denominators, and we were talking about this this morning. Um, uh, the monominators are uh, amazing, needed. I think something, I think there's a paper written, uh, it was written a couple of months ago, I think, the denominators are something worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, there's a lot of information coming out from the COVID pandemic, the number of deaths coming out, and you see, the, you see a lot of numerators being thrown around, right? But the big, the big question is, what is the denominator? How does this translate into rates? So I, the census is changing their methods, and they're changing the way they publish data, and so I'm working on that a little bit, but I don't think that's going to be my work. Uh, my life's project It's just a project I'm doing because I do care about the nominators as an applied developer. And occasionally, uh, I'm an environmental demographer, um, um, and I'll tell you why, if we have time at the end, why I say occasionally, because I have no training in environmental demography. Uh, so welcome to the talk. And uh, so this is me every day I come to the office. Every day I feel like Bob Simpson going to his first day of school. Every day I want to discover something. Every day I want to find out about a new pattern or like an idea. I probably went home and I said, like, I'll think about it tomorrow. And, and one of these ideas was, you know, I come out of my PhD without a single publication and I'm sitting as a teaching faculty at Penn State and I say, I need to start publishing. So I start, I ask myself, what's happening with this measure of self-reported mental health. Self-reported mental health is not collected in the United States as much. I think it was collected in National Health Interview Survey uh, two years, uh, because we collect the, the Kessel score, the sociological distress, uh, to measure uh, mental health. But you know, one thing I asked myself trying to get this first publication out was whether or not this measure of self-reported mental health follows a pattern consistent with the epidemiological paradox or whether it follows a pattern closely resembling the self-reported health, the physical general self-reported health. And the answer is that it actually follows the epidemiological paradox. And I can tell you uh, there's many reasons why, but simply said, minorities have been found consistently to report better mental health outcomes. <laughs> and there's a lot of theories posited around why this is happening. But I, this brings me back to the questions about how do we talk about our health? How do we, what things go into our minds when we issue such a, a strong statement about our well-being that is captured in a five-item response? And so in 2017, I was working in this paper, and parallel to me, this amazing author that is more and more accomplished than me, I was publishing her own work on actually the same things. Uh, as you can see, actually, the titles almost match. And this is a children's book trying to teach children how to speak Spanish and how to ask questions about how you're doing, right? And, uh, and again, I, I really admire your work. And these this two, this, this two or three uh, characters from the, the book are going to be with us during the whole presentation. But one thing I was focusing on here, and I think probably it's one of the first things I did with heterogeneity, was start approaching how Latinos report health in the United States and asking, do Latinos in the United States who take surveys in Spanish consistently report poorer health when you stratify them by different Hispanic origins? And the answer is no. Um, so not all Latinos are created equal type of approach here. Um, it is more persistently found that Hispanic or Latinos who are taking surveys in Spanish they consistently report worse health. But that is only true if you are not a Mexican-American. And anybody knows why Mexican-Americans in particular may not be reporting worse health when they take the survey in Spanish? No, no. They don't speak Spanish as well? Yeah. They have already assimilated to how health is measured in the United States. And also, they probably already have an idea of you know, the, the, the word that I'm going to talk about only operates in the way it operates for foreign-born Latinos if you actually were born or raised in a Spanish-speaking set. So something like that. So but it's consistently, you know, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, people from Central America, other, other Hispanic, you know, the catch-all group, 
Ignorance, if they are interviewed in Spanish, they report for self. Mexican Americans do not. So can I ask you a question? Yes. So if the Mexican Americans, your argument is there, you know, is the assimilation and the fact that they don't speak Spanish that well, this is why they I don't know if it's that well, but yeah, but why wouldn't then they take the, the survey in English? They they're given actually the option of taking it in English or Spanish. They choose to take it in Spanish. So I, I have no no answer to that. Although that's actually a very good question. But I don't I don't know. But they're 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 told which which in which uh, they're 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 asked whether they want to take it in English or Spanish and they choose to take it in Spanish. But but they're Mexican American they classify themselves. Are these in person surveys? In person surveys, yes. And is the interview on uh, ah, yeah. Mexican American? No, or, no, no, no. It's or, it's an and I, it's a CDC employee, right? right. So uh, the story is that these two year apps are trying to find out the how these ostriches go. Like, so come estas, how are you? And uh, you see the tree. Uh, what's happening here? I don't know how to respond, right? So and this leads me to self-reported health as a metric that I'm very interested in. But the more I learn about it, the less I know about it. And I think that's true for almost any topic. You finish a paper and you have three more questions uh, than, than you had when you were started. But this, this metric is, 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 is relied upon consistently uh, collected where you pretty much have, this is very easy to collect. It, it does not cost as much as biomarker data to collect. And it's been used for years. You can say your health is excellent. And that's your, your top. Uh, health status, right? And you can say it's poor. Um, but the problem here is that I, I don't know how many of you have actually ever said your health is excellent. Uh, I myself, I, you know, I was raised in a, in, a, in a very interesting background where I could not brag about my health because if I walk out of my house, something's going to happen. Because I was bragging about my health like three minutes before. So there's many things that can go into like how we talk about our health. For me, when they ask how you're doing, probably good is top what I would say. I'm feeling optimal, but I'll say, ah, I'm feeling awesome, very good. But excellent is not how I would speak about my health. <laughs> so you end up in a situation like this. You can end up in a situation where somebody can say, this is fine, and things can be burning around. Or the other way around. You can end up with somebody who is burning inside, but everything is good around them, right? And so it gets even more complicated when you add language in the mix, because what I'm, what I'm positing here is that the way these words are translated are biasing the way we're collecting the data for Hispanics in the United States. So this category fair in particular comes to mind. So what I'm saying here is that probably people can move around the gradient of responses at different speeds. But this idea of regular complicates issues when you're studying Hispanics in the United States. And it's, it's, it's a complicated word. For many reasons, and I think I can, I can, I can. I'll try to explain to you why it's complicated. Uh, but just why do we care about this? Because Spanish respondents in the United States are answering they have worse health, more so than English responding Latinos in the United States. So it is a very noticeable pattern that has been happening since 1998. So. You know, if you are using self-reported health to assess health disparities in the United States, I have news. Uh, there's something happening within the Hispanic group that traditionally what people have done, if you look at papers published in the mid-1990s or the, until, I think, in the early 2010s, like, the comparisons used to be black-white. And uh, a lot of papers are still do that. But I, 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 what I care about Latino health, I want to study Hispanic the disparities within the Hispanic group, and I want to include them in my analysis. And it's about 30% of Hispanic respondents answer uh, national surveys in Spanish. So you kind of seem to just get rid of them. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 they are there for a reason, and they're part of the population. So my question here that, that I always go to bed is, like, has measurement bias checked our ability to understand minority health particularly for Latinos in the United States? So I want to introduce you to my grandmother, Juana. Uh, Juana, uh, I grew up in a very interesting uh, multi-generational setting. We lived in her house until I was uh, 14, 15, I don't know that. Um, and so Juana 
is a diabetic, and she experienced a lot of health deteriorations across um, my life and her life also. But I'd say she was actually my first professor of allostatic load stuff because I grew up listening about her triglycerides, about her sugar levels, her blood pressure, like taking her to her appointments. She was my teacher, particularly because she was also the launch lady in our community, in, the, in the school that I went to. And so, you know, like, she started deteriorating, she had an amputation, this is me and my brother, uh, taking care of her in her house. Uh, and, like, late, at the end of her life, she was bedridden, and she required 24-7 support, right? But this guy who you see here with hair and a smile that academia has taken away, uh, he actually had a lot of, uh, I still have a smile, it's just no doubt. And, uh, and uh, he actually went to San Antonio to do his PhD, and so I would call home every day to ask how my grandmother was doing. And so, what's her health status is here? What's my reaction is here? So if they say they will are, I'm happy. She's doing well within her condition. Okay? She's doing bien. I'm happy also. She was regular yesterday, today she's doing better. Okay? Regular, I'm still okay, but I'm starting to wonder what's happening because she went from bien to regular. Right? Then it's like, bien, I'm still happy, but then she goes to bad. And it's like, something happened because my mom went from bien, regular, to mal. So something's not working. Something's not working. And if they say regular, actually I'm not happy as I was before because this regular is preceded by she not doing well. So in order to understand the meaning that regular has for Spanish-speaking populations, you have to truly contextualize what regular is. It's so-so, with, well within her condition. It can have so many meanings. And it can actually be a way for not saying bad when things are not going that well. Because like, I, I don't think my family wanted to give me bad news that grandma wasn't doing well. Um, and if they say mild, then I'm, I'm, I'm then sadder because she went from a mild improvement to like back to bad. So there's, at least in my experience, there's a lot that goes into this word. I don't know if you agree, would agree with this as a Spanish speaker yourself, but this is my own experience with this self-reported health. I mean, it's the grandmother's self-reported health, I guess, here. I mean, grandmother's health status, because she's not reporting it herself. Um, so the giraffes keep asking, you know, how are you feeling? Are you hungry? And the answer is no. Like, are you scared? And the answer is no. Like, are you annoyed? And the answer is no. Actually, the Italian is not how we would translate this word, but you can start like, this, this is published already. It's already in the field. It has been peer reviewed. It's already, <laughs> right? And then, so then we end up with the question always asking, so how are you doing? How are you doing? Like, we end up with the question even at the end. It's like, and then the industry just like, well, let me see if I can answer this question. Right? So I'm going to talk to you about a little bit of my research. It has taken me 20 minutes to get here. But I'll, I'll tell you why this is important. Because now I'm trying to connect bodies, time use, and mortality to what's happening to Hispanic populations in the United States. So in a paper published with Jeff Howard in Biomography and Social Biology, what we try to do is using these allostatic load measures is saying, is allostatic load, patterns of physiological dysregulation in our bodies, associated equally to health status reports by race and ethnicity in the United States? There's a crash course on allostatic load, although a watch slide would not do justice to the concept, but it's an index or count ranging from 0 to n, where n is the number of biomarkers considered, considered indicating the number of biomarkers that exceed a clinically determined threshold or mathematically determined threshold. Um, and you can have biomarkers from the cardiovascular, metabolic, and inflammation or immunological responses within your body. And you, you look at what are the ranges, you look at a cutoff point, and you end up with a score that tells you how many of them exceed the threshold. And that tells you something about the, the, the biological risk profiles of this population. The one I use has 10 biomarkers, but there's a paper in Journal of Racial Ethnic Health Disparities that has I think 21 different algorithms in which in ways that people conceptualize and measure all static load, but I'll just limit myself to the 10 that I, it's like, so three in the cardiovascular, five in the metabolic, two in the inflammation. And so higher levels of allostatic load were associated with higher odds of, report, of reporting poor, fair, self-reported health. However, this association differed by race ethnicity. 
the analysis of interactions by race and ethnicity suggests that allostatic load is less associated with poor fair share reported health among non-Hispanic black adults and Hispanic adults. So what's happening in our bodies is not equally connected with what we're saying our health is, or health status is. And they demonstrate, this is after all a subjective health measure, uh, the ratings potentially underestimate actual measures of biological health risk, especially for minorities. And this has a lot of importance when we're thinking about how health uh, population health questions are asked in the United States and the way we establish a reference group and the way we compare groups. And when we look at Latinos or uh, Hispanic adults in the United States, it gets very interesting because what we're seeing is that language now is playing a role here. And Latinos who answer the, the, the NHIS in Spanish, their biological risk profiles correspond even less to the, what their, their health status reports are doing. So allostatic load only increases lots of reporting the outcome for those who have answered in English in a significant way. So I think we need to start thinking a little bit more about this, the way we're collecting this data, particularly for multilingual comparisons. Now the NHIS, I think you can actually um, stratify that they have included in later releases the non-Hispanic Asian population. And this effect actually not being studied for Asian populations, but also we know that if their answer in a language that is not English, uh, from studies done in the, 90, in the 1990s, that they report worse health if they're not answering in English. So there may be something happening with, with that population also. So I move on to the bodies and I talk to wonder about behaviors. How do time use patterns look when we compare people who talk about uh, their health being good or bad, how we classify with this dichotomy measure? Um, and with this is a paper with Michael Fintong, uh a uh, sociology student at Pesce uh, from Ecuador. And so we posit that you know, there's this idea of the eight hours, eight hours to sleep, eight hours for leisure, and what's the other one? The work, of course, right? <laughs> and uh, so, and we posit that you're gonna have a pattern very consistent with those eight hour divisions if you have a good health, but if you have poor health, we would posit that there's gonna be less people like working, like, like less time devoted to work. And what we find in the paper is that for non Hispanic whites and non Hispanic blacks, mind you, that these two groups are not answering in Spanish, the, the NHIS, at least not at, at the levels that the Hispanic population are. They spend more time in personal care, leisure, and less time in paid work, volunteering, caregiving, education, in comparison to those who report good, uh, being a good health status. So less time in paid work, volunteering, caregiving more time in personal and leisure. So the, you see a shift in, uh, from the work to the other category, right? Uh, which is rest, and it's not truly sleep, it's resting, right? And so, uh, but more so for work. And among Hispanic, the differences were found only for personal care, paid work, leisure, and volunteering. And those who answered in English displayed similar patterns to this ones found up here whereas the ones who answered in Spanish have their own patterns, meaning that these groups are not, these groups are different in terms of how they spend their time, but, let's see if I get this right. They're different in how they use their time, but Hispanic adults who answer in Spanish have a very unique pattern to themselves, so something is not being captured well for them. We already have our bodies telling us something. I already have behavioral patterns telling us something. And there's uh, this poster, and I, there's a reason why this is a poster. This poster was presented in PAA 2016, and I swear, last week I sent Matt a manuscript, so in the next seven years, I promise we'll send it out. <laughs> and so but we presented this as a poster because we wanted to know, you know, there's, there's a paper by Finch and Homer, and uh, Anna Sajakova has done this also in her work, but we wanted to know what's the role of language of interview and the predictive power of self-reported health in terms of mortality. What we find is that you know, we always find that self-reported health 
predicts mortality. What, what previous scholars have found is that the predicted power either increases or reduces. And what we find is that for Spanish subsample, this, this association is maybe slower than it is uh, for the English sample. So again, now we have our bodies, now we have our time patterns, now we have this, yes? So these are all Latinos, like just what language yeah. they entered in? Yes, well, so full sample, uh, English sample, and then Spanish sample. Okay. Right. So what, what we're finding here is that the predicted power is, is slower, still stronger, still, still in the right direction, but for uh, uh, the Spanish sample is, is, is lower, lower the effect than it is for the English subsample. Um, so, so I think what I what I come out of this is knowing that that there's more research to be done, but there's a serious limitation in how self-reported health is, is being captured for Latinos in the United States, particularly when you have 30% of the sample answering in, in Spanish. It's something that we should probably take a look at. Um, this is just a summary of what I what I've said. Well, you know, time for Q&A. So about androgeneity and mortality, um, with, with a friend of mine, I think I presented this this morning, uh, I've, I have these coffee meetings with some colleagues, and some of them are rural demographers, and some of them are, are uh, people who specialize in mortality, and I said, like, one day we were having coffee, I was like, you know, I wonder whether this pattern that we have assumed to be well established, whether it varies at the intersections of race, ethnicity, and place. So I'm going to present to you something that uh, we've been working on for a couple of months, but that brings me back to the idea of heterogeneity. It brings me back to this idea that we need to start studying these, these nuances and these patterns uh, with, a, with a closer, uh, with a magnifying glass, maybe. And it's this idea of the rural urban uh, mortality penalty, that, that you know, there's a lot of work by Cosman. And, uh, and, and so, you know, there, there's this pattern that rural populations have higher uh, mortality, and, uh, and it's consistent for every race in the United States. But when we look at the intersection of these by race and states, what we find is that there's differences in these patterns, where, for example, for the non-Hispanic black population, non-Hispanic black, uh, you still have uh, mortality being higher in urban areas, in the West, in the Northeast, in the Midwest, not in the South. Uh, for Latinos in particular, um, the, there's very similar in the Midwest, uh, higher urban in the Northeast, and then the penalty is more observable in the South and in the West. So we're, this, this is not the bulk of my work, right? But what I'm trying to get at here is that there's a lot of people that nowadays are looking at more and more of these heterogeneous patterns. And they're going back to the drawing board in terms of trying to approach things through a different lens and like, truly trying to ascertain whether or not this, has, this holds when you break the data in different ways. This is the same. So I'll just uh, wrap up by saying that there's a conversation with the giraffe and the ostrich, right? Like, like, how are you doing? And the ostrich is excited. Apparently, she wasn't new in the water hole. And why? It's like because she made new amigos. So you know, it's always nice meeting people. It has been, for me, a pleasure to come here and uh, meet so many persons. And I look forward to the Q&A. And uh, so the Q&A, I guess, is going to be like a party, right? And so thank you for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. Questions, comments? Thank you so much for this presentation. It was really interesting. I'm curious if, because um, it seems your scale is based on language a lot. Have you been able to look at it based on like numerical rankings of like one being worse than the rest? So, yes. It's like, I think the issue is that I don't collect this data. So the, the numbers are not given to the persons. The persons are given the categories. So I do get a numerical score from the data, but it's always tied to that. Um, I've never done that type of work. I think what I want to truly do is, is look at that, that word, that regular word, and actually just start interviewing people and see what do they understand that that word means. Uh, because for me, it means something, and then I ask my brother, it means another thing. 
I think there's not a general consensus of what regular means. But uh, you know, numerically, I I think there's persons who have done it you know, out of zero to ten. How would your health be? Um, but I haven't seen like that data in actual studies, which are the ones they analyze. Nevertheless, it's like actually a, a question whether it's a really good question whether if we do it numerically, whether or not the answer would be the same. Because the five, like what would five be, uh, good or average, or and then what is the average? Like, it, like I guess more, it, it, it would bring up more questions about. It will bring me back to asking the same question: Is what do people, what goes into people talking about their health? But yeah, that's that's the stuff. Yeah, uh, very interesting talk. Have you thought of implementing some kind of experimental design to answer this question to more clearly narrow yeah. down the effect of language? Yeah, not me, but people have done it, and they've actually done an experimental design when they replace regular with pasable or any other, you know, other Latin, uh, Spanish words that have been used in other Spanish-speaking contexts like Spain. And what they find is that the use of regular hyperinflates the rate at which Latinos are reporting poor health. If you use a word like pasable or a more closer to a translation of fair, like I, also who talks about their health and says that it's fair? I, I don't know. I've never said my health is fair. But like when the word very maps better to the concept of fair, like the rate of Latinos reporting worse health goes down. And they've done it in, in different ways. So they do like a like like, like word uh, they call it a, a, a word switching experiment. So they give you the beginning, they give you one of them, and then at the end, they give you the other one, and then they measure the difference of, across them. But it's consistent with that word is the one that is we know is hyperinflating estimates of poor health for Latinos. I guess I was more thinking about randomly assigning the English questionnaire versus the Spanish questionnaire. Oh, no. Comparison. I haven't thought about that. a group of Hispanics. No. Want to do it? Try it up. In Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. Great talk. This is so interesting. I was struck, um, one of the first slides you showed was um, the percent of um, Latinos reporting yeah. fair for self-rated health over time. Yeah. And sort of the rapid, yeah, this one here, the rapid rise that you see around, you know, 2007. And, and I'm just wondering if you thought at all about how the political context also plays in here, right? That that this is also a time where we saw, we saw yeah. a huge yeah. explosion yeah. of like, yeah. Anti-immigrant, restrictive yep, yep. immigration policies um, happening, mm -hmm. high levels of deportations yep. and arrests. Yep, and so yep. that might be particularly salient for people who are speaking Spanish, presumably yeah, more yeah. likely to be immigrants. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts or reflections about that. Yeah. Um, let's see. I swear we did not coordinate this question. <laughs> but I love the envelope in your yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm starting to study, you know, going back to this question, this is out already, immigrant minority health, but it's like, you know, with this pattern, what truly is happening is that more people are reporting. Non-US born are the ones who are reporting poor fair health at higher levels. It's not happening to US born Spanish respondents. It's not happening to non-US born uh, English respondents. It's only for non-US born, uh, non-US born Spanish respondents. When you look at it, it's always it's clustered towards people reporting regular at higher levels uh, than, than, than the, the English respondents. And it's, there's no significant change in the pattern for the English the Mala. It's only for regular that we're seeing this steady increase. And I think it may be a reflection of many things. But I did think a lot about how George W. Bush weaponized, uh, you know, started discussing Latinos more as a threat. In fact, there's also previous blame to some demographers that, that framed the Hispanic growth as a challenge. Uh, there was a lot of discussions about the Texas challenge back then about uh, Texas is a challenge because in 2050 it's no longer going to be a majority white. And so there was a lot of work being done on this. And I think certainly there was there's something to be said in the, with not U.S. born. I mean, the enforcement issues. You know how ICE has grown so fast and so quickly. Has uh, whether the, the reach of ICE has been expanded. I mean, today it's even worse, right? They can even go into state college because it's it's like 200 miles from any border, and they take the border to mean also the, the chores. 
So yeah, I think there's something there, particularly because when you see the effect, it's mostly for not US more, but I haven't approached it to try to quantify all these, maybe, okay, channel. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, this is really interesting. So I'm curious if you, um, you looked at or if you are aware of research that's looked at intersections of this with, like, for example, other characteristics, I'm thinking about like gender or age. Have you thought about, have you looked at that? Have people thought about how this might vary, like further heterogeneity within racial ethnic categories? Mm. What in particular? So I'm thinking about like responses here in terms of how like the kind of subjective measures uh -huh. of health uh, uh -huh. relate to, or are mm. related to actual biophysical measures of health and mm. whether that varies within racial ethnic category. I mean, you're, like, so you're speaking to it a little bit here with foreign born versus not foreign born. Yeah. Uh, but I'm curious if you looked at any other dimension. No. Okay. Not yet. But, you know, if a collaborator emerges that wants to do it, more than happy to like like sit down and talk. Do you have my email? Just like, that's the website. Okay. Wendy? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I was really uh, interested by the uh, point you made about how some studies from the 90s found a similar effect mm -hmm. with Asian mm -hmm. um, survey takers, yeah. whether they used English or non-English. And uh, I'm just I'm, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about more about that and whether you think that there is anything going on here that could yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The I, I think it has to do with translation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the the way things have been translated, I think on a daily basis in Puerto Rico, for example, we will get TV shows translated in California, and so it's like a very U.S. neutral Spanish version of Spanish, whereas my friends in Mexico will get Mexico translated shows. I think the issue is that they deployed a translation of these questions to mirror what is collected in the English survey. Uh, after all, what we want is comparability. But without, pro I, I cannot, I was not in the room, I probably was too young to be in those rooms. But I think my hunch is that somebody translated this without going out and testing it in the field, and administering it to port. I mean, think about this was translated in the early 1990s, so, being increased level of awareness about how things should be done at the community level and like whether consult communities and whether you know whether we should prescribe whether rather than to learn and I think some of the articles that I've read and I don't do Asian Asian health uh, research but it has hinted at that the, the categories being used not being uh, not mirroring correctly to what is being collected in the English one because those categories are not used to talk about health by those groups. And I said, again, like who says my health is excellent? Like I I don't know if any of you have had, but please tell me you have, but I I've never done it. Right? And so it's 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 an issue of language, it's an issue of translation and how the questions were like implemented to be collected. Uh, but I, I, I have not looked into details for those particular populations. But I, 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 I've sent some emails trying to like find out who translated the Spanish one. And I, I still haven't found out who it was. But I do know that it's collected differently in Spain. So what I do know is that this collection with regular is a US thing. No, very interesting. Peter, in, in these uh, you know, measures, uh, there's always a tension between having